I'm Tisha Bader. Thank you for joining us for this JBS News Special. The Anti-Defamation League has announced a first-of-its-kind initiative to tackle rising anti-Semitism around the world. The J7 Global Task Force on Fighting Anti-Semitism, made up of top Jewish advocacy organizations in seven countries across the globe. And we're so honored to be joined by the CEO of the ADL, Jonathan Greenblatt, to tell us more about this new coordinated international effort. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to be on JBS, so thank you for having me. Thank you. So fighting anti-Semitism by the ADL, along with many other Jewish organizations, nothing new. You've been doing it since your founding. What is unique about the J7? Well, if we just step back for a minute, let's acknowledge that the ADL may be the oldest anti-hate organization in America, but we have counterpart agencies all over the world who are also fighting anti-Semitism and hate in their countries. And the truth is that fight has never been more ferocious, or at least not in recent memory. So we've seen in America an unprecedented surge of anti-Semitic incidents. We were literally in 2022, over 500% more incidents that happened just a decade ago. And it was the highest number that year that we've ever seen in tracking this data for almost 45 years. That kind of rise, that kind of surge isn't unique to America. We see it across Western Europe, we see it in South America, we see it in Australia, we see it all over the world. And so in this moment, what's unique about J7 is the largest diaspora communities, all in liberal democracies, all the populations of 100,000 people or more coming together for one expressed reason, to harness our collective capabilities, share best practices, coordinate strategies in order to defeat anti-Semitism. Now look, there have been diaspora efforts before. We have the amazing World Jewish Congress. We have the terrific World Zionist Organization, and there are others. But this is about one thing and one thing only, fighting anti-Jewish hate. That's why we think this is so important. And I want to just mention the countries that are involved in this effort. As you mentioned, these are large Jewish communities around the world. So aside from the United States, of course, you have Canada, the UK, Germany, France, Argentina, and Australia. Mm -hmm. Talk about choosing these specific countries and some of the different challenges that they face on their own in fighting anti-Semitism. Well, they all face challenges. So in some places, like in Western Europe, There is a problem with a kind of entrenched uh, radical Islamic threat that comes from, you know, particularly North African and Middle Eastern communities living side by side with the Jewish community. In Western Europe, like in Eastern Europe, like here, we also have a rising threat of right wing extremism. These can be our militia types, white supremacists, neo-Nazis. And in many countries like Canada, Argentina, uh, there's also in arguably Australia, an amplifying left wing threat, which is a hardened anti-Zionist kind of radical perspective. And so whether it's political extremism or religious extremism or lone wolves, or even just these climates that are so intemperate and intolerant for Jews, all of us are dealing with these challenges. Now I should be clear, The way that we uh, demarcated this group was number one, we wanted to look for liberal democracies, right? That have kind of parallels or from where lessons can be learned and applied, number one. Number two, we looked for communities of 100,000 people or more. So that immediately kind of led to triage between a larger body. And then number three, we looked for communal organizations which wanted to work with us. Now, there are other large Jewish communities in diaspora. I think of Brazil. I think of um, Hungary. I think of South Africa. I mean, there are others. And so we may grow this group over time. But as it turns out that choosing, again, as I did, 100,000 people or more in liberal democracies is a lot, makes it, turns out we're a lot like the G7 on which this is based. But again, whereas the G7 is this global configuration based on GDP, 
the largest economic uh, you know, powers in the world. This is based on Jewish population and liberal democracies. So it's interesting, you know, you have the two sides of the coin. Of course, the need for creating such a body comes from rising anti-Semitism, which which has been a challenge and a struggle and, and a and a really frightening phenomenon, as you mentioned, over the last several years in particular. But the positive side, I suppose you could say, is like you said, finding these communities to unite with and to find the commonalities as well as where they're different and sort of unite in this effort and perhaps also just learn more about the other and how we can help each other and, you know, reminding us of that we are one people at the end of the day. I couldn't agree more. I mean, again, I think in liberal democracies, we're dealing with many of the same challenges. How do you balance free speech concerns with hate speech and harmful speech controls? How do you balance increasing political polarization, right, with people being able to assemble in ways that they choose? How do you deal with uh, the normalization of extremism in environments where you want to have, you know, a plurality of people being able to participate in the process? So there are two sides to the coin on all these issues. But again, how social media amplifies anti-Semitism, how political polarization increases anti-Semitism how indeed you know extremist elements instrumentalize anti-jewish hate to advance their agenda we're all dealing with this so i believe we can learn from each other and you know look the jewish people are never stronger than we are when we are together and what i believe i think what our history teaches us is when we're united extraordinary miraculous things are possible so i'm optimistic that through the j7 and you'll see we'll have an annual summit. We'll have work streams on issues like social media, politics, college campuses, so we can again learn from each other and do the work. How did this idea sort of, what was the the germ for this? I mean, aside from rising anti-Semitism, is this something that you've thought about for a long time as far as creating an even larger task well, force? Look, when I was in the, um, you know, I served in the, white house in a prior life i ran the office of social innovation for president obama and i staffed a few g7 summits i actually chaired a g7 process on economic issues with uh sir ronald cohen who's a major jewish philanthropist in the uk and we did that when the us hosted and when the uk hosted i think that was 2012 and 2013 or something like that anyways i've seen how a g7 process works and then actually on the sidelines of the 125th anniversary of the first World Zionist Congress in Basel. Uh, I was there along with my counterparts from France. And again, on the sidelines, we were talking about the utility of, you know, we regularly talk to them and to our counterparts in the UK and in Canada and Israel and all these other countries. And we were saying, wouldn't it be useful if we could do this in a more sustained and almost strategic way? So out of those conversations, based on the existing G7 model is how this took shape. But I really have to credit our friends from the CREF in France who really helped to you know, ideate this concept. So interesting. So you mentioned the White House. How will this task force either sort of work with or complement um, the national strategy that the Biden administration announced just a few months ago? Well, that's a great question. You know, so look, the Biden administration's national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which, you know, in full disclosure, ADL was very involved in that. There were some elements of it we didn't agree with, but we gave a lot of suggestions that showed up in the final version. The most important headline for this conversation is that national strategy is precedent setting. It's never something that's ever happened before. It prioritizes anti-Semitism and elevates it to a key imperative of this administration. But most importantly, it acknowledges that we need a whole of society approach to fight anti-Jewish hate. There's no silver bullet. So it's going to take actions by the federal government and state and local. It's going to take the business community, you know, bringing its resources. It's going to take civil society and houses of worship 
and other actors showing up and sticking around to make a difference. So as all of that takes shape, as we see government and business and nonprofits engage, I think what's powerful about the J7 <clears throat> is now they have a, a grouping, if you will, with which to engage. Because the J7 includes the representative bodies of Jewish communities in all of these countries. So here's a good example, right? Lord John Mann in the UK is a remarkable leader who has done great work to try to bring the British government to focus on the issue of fighting anti-Semitism. I'm excited now through J7 for uh, Lord Mann to share his experience, for us to be able to share the national strategy, and for our counterparts in Canada and Australia and Argentina who lack a national plan to learn from these models and then be able to lobby their governments that way. That would be incredibly powerful. And you mentioned Argentina, as you said, every country has its challenges and its history with anti-Semitism. Argentina, of course, um, was targeted by two tragic, deadly terror attacks um, and has that history that it carries with it, which I'm sure will inform a lot of the conversations it has. Of course, right? Like I think uh, the Jewish community of Argentina is forever scarred by those incidents. And let me just say, yes, they were definitely terror acts, but I also think they should be contextualized and characterized as acts of war, mm. acts of war perpetrated by the Islamic Republic of Iran, not against the state of Israel, although they were that, but against the Jewish people. Iran continues to be the most anti-Semitic government you know, in modernity. We haven't seen a, a one single regime since Nazi Germany employ such ugly, venomous rhetoric and seek to actively murder Jews around the world. And to whether they do it directly or they're sponsoring proxies like Hezbollah and others to do it, the outcome is the same and the intention is the same. So those were acts of war. And that definitely is on the mind of, I think, the, our, our, our brothers and sisters in Argentina and all of us in the J7. Talk a bit about this, this body um, that's going to have, as you said, anti-Semitism, dealing with anti-Semitism is the, is the one thing that everyone is going to be doing, and that is the focus. And as several people who responded, uh, organizations who are going to be working with you noted is that you know, things often start with the Jews, they don't end with the Jews. That's right. And this idea that perhaps even the mere existence of such a body of this J7, even though its focus is going to be on combating anti-Semitism, I'm, I'm assuming that there is some hope that this position that the these all these countries are going to come together to work towards will trickle down into fighting hate globally, fighting fanatical forces, like you mentioned, Iran, and other uh, hateful look, groups that threaten um, it is an, the world. I think it is, uh, I appreciate the observation, or like the kind of projecting forward. I think you might be right. I can tell you that initially, we'll have these work streams on things like extremism and security, social media, education against anti-Semitism, probably do a track for student leaders. I mean, there's just so much to do to fight the kind of hydra-headed monster that is anti-Jewish hate. And yet, to your point, as, as Ambassador Lipstadt has said, it starts with the Jews and never ends with the Jews. So I think the fact is there may be learnings and applications from our experience that we can share, that we can share with other diaspora communities. Like for example, in the United States, Asian Americans face some very similar challenges to the Jewish community. Wrongly stereotyped, considered a model minority, frequently harassed and, uh, and bullied in public places, et cetera. And there are Asian you know, subpopulations in some of the countries we've mentioned of, of some size, like Canada, you know, like the UK, like France. So maybe there are indeed ways we could work with those communities. Um, and I also think as we engage in these ongoing consultations, 
as we generate output, there may be value for us to engaging with the governments of these regions and more. And maybe we can use the J7 to amplify existing bodies like the World Jewish Congress or the World Zionist Organization. And even going back to, uh, you know, uh, Israel and engaging with and dialoguing with the foreign ministry and the government of Israel, which I think will likely take a strong interest in what we're doing, too. So I think there's lots of opportunity for engagement, for dialogue and to share insights that we learn. And since you bring up Israel, since we have a few more minutes, I would love to just ask you, um, I know the ADL released a statement with the passage of the reasonableness bill in the Knesset of, of deep disappointment, of profound disappointment at that decision. Can you talk a bit about um, that statement and what the feeling is and also recognizing that we are, um, that Tisha B'Av, yeah. um, we're talking about um, the commemoration of the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem and this idea of sinat chinam, of baseless hatred being one of the root causes of the destruction of the second temple. So just with that in mind, talking about this, Tisha, this difficult situation in Israel right now. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that. Look, I'm an American Jewish leader. I was born here. I've raised my children here. But I am a... I am a unapologetic, unabashed, unambiguous Zionist. Um, and that is not just because of my deep affection and appreciation for the democratic and Jewish state of Israel. It's because as a Jew, I know that Zionism represents not just 75 years of a political entity, but thousands of years of longing for Zion. And during these nine days of Av, as you were sort of alluding to, we remember what happened when the Jews suffered from baseless hatred. And I think too often we see, even here in America, you know, I, I will tell you that I have a standing policy. As the head of the ADL, I will not criticize other Jewish organizations. I won't do it. I know that ADL is routinely criticized by folks on the right for being too liberal by folks on the left for being too conservative. I don't participate in any of that. I won't be a party to any of that. When Jews fight with other Jews, it's the anti-Semites who win. So I have no interest in these sort of inner scene kind of battles because I think they belittle us, they diminish us. And again, our history teaches us, our history teaches us that when there is baseless hatred, when we don't have shalom bayit, we've seen the impact on our institutions, on our holiest places. So I won't do it, and I don't. And for what, just as an acknowledgement, uh, I, that doesn't mean I won't call out anti-Zionism. I will call it anti-Zionism. I will call it anti-Zionism every day of the week. Whether the people perpetrating it are Jews or non-Jews, I'll call it out because it's anti-Semitism, but I will not engage with people whom I deeply, 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 deeply disagree in, you know, again, baseless hatred. I just won't do it. So, but that brings us to Israel. So we love Israel. I love Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people. With Jerusalem as its eternal capital. No doubt in my mind. None. I will tell you that I'm not a political scientist and I am not sure what is necessarily the best configuration for that government, but it's standing as a liberal democracy, I think is a key success factor in its standing in the world. Particularly it's standing with the Western countries who have long supported it in lots of different ways, material support, moral support, et cetera. And as a country who in its declaration of independence recognized the importance of its own diversity, recognize the importance of equality for all people, not just for you know observant Jews, but for secular, not just for Jews, but for Arabs, not just for, you know, again, Jewish worshipers, but for Muslims and Christians, etc. And today you have the Baha'i as a large presence, and Circassians have a large presence. And look, it's a very special place because of the, the Druze there, and it's just its richness is part of its wonder. And so what does worry me is not 
just when there are changes to the government that would cement one group in power over the other and curtail the democracy, although that's a problem. But when we see kind of baseless hatred against the other side, when we see a lack of humility among the participants, when we see an unwillingness to engage in a real process of compromise, I have nothing but respect for the demonstrators who week, day after day, week after week, month after month, have been peacefully protesting in the country. Now, maybe there have been moments here or there on the margins for sure, but the overwhelming majority of them have been protesting peacefully, demonstrating, you know, if I could paraphrase uh, an author who I am not very fond of his work, the triumph of Zionism. You see it playing out in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Jerusalem, in Beersheba, all over the country. It's amazing and it's something to behold. Peaceful demonstrations, the likes of which America has never seen and I doubt we could ever sustain. So in this moment, when we have the triumph of peaceful protest, exercising their democratic rights, I worry about those rights being curtailed, but I equally worry about the inability to compromise and the unwillingness of cooler heads to prevail. And look, it is, the, it is the responsibility of the majority, not to protect their rights, but to protect the rights of the minority. That's how democracies survive. That's how they're sustained. And so what I'm seeing is very worrisome. And I say that because, to your question, during these nine days, when we mourn the destruction of the first temple and the second temple and the other tragedies that befell our people, for me, Israel, Medina Israel, it is our third temple. It is our third temple. And so I worry deeply about um, our enemies trying to exploit these, this moment and these divisions. Because as I said before, in the context of J7, nothing can stop the Jewish people when we come together. And ultimately, I think our greatest enemy is ourselves. And so I hope that cooler heads will prevail, that leadership will recognize the responsibility in a majoritarian government to protect minority rights. Israel will continue to flourish. And if nothing else, if you want to keep it as simple as possible so that the coalition government will retain its fidelity to the ideas enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League. It's always an honor to have you. It's very exciting news about the J7. I hope we'll have you back on to hear more about how this group progresses, what actually happens on the ground and going forward. We would love you to come back on to talk about it further. It, it and would, Thank you. It would be my privilege. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. And thank you for watching JBS. <laughs>